Welcome to Let's Talk Near Death, the podcast show that talks about life, death, and experiences somewhere in between. I'm Kirsty Salisbury, the host of the show, and I hope you'll join me as I chat to everyday people with not-so-everyday experiences. You may also wish to join the conversation over in the Let's Talk Near Death online community, which is found at www.letstalknearedeath.com. Membership is free, or you're welcome to upgrade to join the live VIP events, to gain early access to episodes, or to receive extra VIP bonus material. Your support helps me to continue to get episodes out and to help grow the conversation around these types of experiences. But before then, let's talk near death. And I woke up and then I realized, wait a second, I was there, but I was here, but I was there. And honestly, I, I didn't understand it. that we are much more than just simply this life floating in the, you know, in the middle of the living room and doing like cartwheels, you know, in the space above the sofa. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Luis Monero, an expert in out-of-body experiences and paranormal phenomena in consciousness. Lewis has also delved into near-death experiences, and today we're going to be chatting about how all of these subjects intersect. Lewis has been featured in a number of television shows and radio programs. All around the world, he's done many, many forms of research. He's had things published in newspapers, in magazines, in all sorts of global distribution. He's also been invited to speak in many international congresses, so many that I'm not actually going to read them out. I'm going to let you go over to his website because there's quite the list there. Lewis is also the author of Demystifying the Out-of-Body Experience. He offers classes, does volunteer work, and is one of the founding partners of Mosaic Wellness and Health, a spiritual institution with a broader approach where individuals can grow in their own way. So, Lewis Monero, welcome to Let's Talk Near Death. It is fabulous to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity and thank you for that introduction. It's, uh, oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. I've taken most of that from your website. So, it's really just a um, confirmation of the work that you have been doing. I'm so looking forward to this conversation. Can you just start at the beginning? Why have you done so much research? Why are you so interested in all of these fields? Um, Well, first of all, because I started having the out-of-body experience when I was uh, a teenager, a preteen, I guess. I must have been about 12 or 13 at the time. And um, at the beginning, the experiences started spontaneous for me. I didn't know what I was having. I didn't know that there was a name for that. I just remembered that it was some type of like cool dream, as I would would call it. Um, And I didn't know how to replicate it, meaning uh, some nights I wanted to have it, you know, but I... I had no idea when it when it happened or why it happened, etc. Later on, of course, I you know started reading some books and people pointed me to the right information and I got more informed and got more techniques. And then, uh, but I think that in the back of my mind, also besides the fact that I was having the experiences, I have a, a scientific background. I graduated as a chemist, so I always tried to understand things the best I could. And I realized that by trying to get to the nitty gritty as much as much as you can, of course, you know, as we were saying, we we never know everything, but as as much as we can understand things, then this helped me to first of all to do certain uh, amount of research, but at the same time to try to explain it to people and you know to bring them along in this uh, you know in this journey and all of the benefits that uh, having these experiences can can provide for us. That's amazing. So you said that you were about 12 years old when you started spontaneously having these experiences? Yes, yes, indeed. I was, you know, a small boy. <laughs> yeah. What what happened? How did you feel that very first time? Were you a little bit nervous or scared or how did it all uh, take place? No, you know, I was surprised. It actually happened because at that time in the 80s, I had just gotten, a, you know, what we call computers back then from my parents. And really, I was just starting to learn computers uh, at that time. So you can imagine in the 80s, this is it, it's nothing like what we have right now. You know, I yeah. wish I had one of these laptops back then. 
I but, know. <laughs> um, yeah, so and one of the cruelest thing about those systems actually is that uh, it didn't have an operating system. I would turn it on and it had just a programming language and I would program it. And when I turned it off, it didn't have a hard disk. So everything that I had played around with, you know, it was gone. So because of that, I had this habit of coming from, from school and like putting my hands on the keyboard and staring at the screen for a while and sort of like organizing in my mind what I wanted to program and play around with. They were very simple programs. But that afternoon I became sleepy and this was in my room. This was connected to a black and white, you know, TV. So we're mm. talking, you know, Stone Age. <laughs> mm. uh, but that afternoon I became sleepy and I just simply, you know, took a nap there in my bed. Maybe because it was more of an intellectual activity, I guess. Uh, about a half an hour later, I realized that I was again staring at the screen, thinking about the program that I was trying to design. And then after a while of thinking about the program, it sort of like dawned on me. And I realized, wait a second, wasn't I sleepy? Didn't I go to sleep? And then sort of like the moment that I turned around to look at my bed, I saw that my body was there. And yes, it surprised me a little bit. There wasn't like a fear or, or scare. It was just a surprising, you know, realization, I guess. And then I came in immediately into my body and I woke up and then I realized, wait a second, I was there, but I was here, but I was there. And honestly, I, I didn't understand it. You know, I didn't understand what had happened. But, you know, the mentality of a 12 year old, probably somebody called me to go play soccer or baseball. And, you know, it was just out of my mind. And I didn't think about it again until until I had the next one, which happened maybe eight, nine, ten months later. Really, they, they, they weren't happening frequently at all. Uh, but in, and after they, a few of them accumulated, that's when I realized that's right. That first one happened, you know, when I was doing this program. And ABCD, and that's re that's really how it started. I didn't, uh, again, I didn't know if there was a name, if everybody did it. I guess I must have assumed that everybody did, and I guess I must have thought that it was so normal that I didn't even think about telling anybody, you know, or mm. really like sharing it. Just like most of the times we don't share our dreams, you know, it's just everybody has them, so but, you know, that's it. And. Um, until I was maybe like 16 or 17 that I think I was with a, uh, having a conversation with some classmates of mine in school and he had had a couple of out-of-body experiences and for him they were very scary and I remember I was saying really for me that that hasn't been the experience I've had a few they have been so normal so mundane really I would be floating in my bedroom floating you know like in the hallway outside my my bedroom and seeing my dog in the middle of the night walking around and going to this you know water bowl and then sleeping again so nothing to <laughs> nothing to write home about mm -hmm. uh and now uh, and so they were very very normal but after we sort of like finished our conversation here with my classmate i realized that the entire cafeteria and everybody that was around us was looking at us like what are you guys talking about? Oh, wow. <laughs> and, and my reaction was really, what? It doesn't happen to you guys? And, and that's really, really that experience sort of like helped me to understand that it was something uh, at least rare, let's put it this way. And that led me to, okay, then let me try to figure out what this is. Because by that time I was 17-ish, something like that. So I sort of like, you know, understood a little bit more about the, about the world. I probably thought I understood everything, but <laughs> I was 17, you know. Yeah. So uh, so then I read the first book. I told my parents, my mother actually bought me the first book and the author already called it there, Astral Travel. And I, I realized, oh, this is what is happening to me. And then obviously I started reading more and more books and I got involved with a few institutions, you know, that, uh, that had a better understanding on it. Then, Everything, you know, I guess uh, grew from there that uh, that would in essence summarize, you know, the, the entire trajectory. Yeah. Wow. So you you actually went through quite some time there thinking that everybody did this. It was completely normal and didn't question that maybe it was only happening to you or select few people. It, it, exactly. And, and, you know, and it wasn't like a conscious choice of me thinking uh, this is normal. It's just that it was just simply an assumption. So right. I just thought that ah, this must be normal. Nothing really 
that important here. I was floating in the, you know, in the middle of the living room and doing like cartwheels, you know, in the space above the sofa. So nothing oh, that wow. uh, at that time, obviously, I didn't understand that there could be, you know, existential implications or health benefits or anything of, you know, what you realize with, with a more mature mindset. But at that time, I was just floating, honestly. Uh, but But they were so not just vivid, but I, I was so aware, so conscious, so lucid. I, I knew that uh, it was different than just, my, than just my regular dreams. But even then, since they were not, uh, you know, anything that I considered out of the ordinary and they presented themselves so normally to me, I just really, I wasn't really scared at all. I wasn't really excited about them either. I just, I was just having them, you know. Mm. So, mm. so, yeah. Were you able to control them at all? So were you able to choose when they happened or how far you traveled? Like you talked about seeing your dog walking around the house and staying quite close to home. Were you able to control going further beyond that out into, you know, out into the city or to see more things? Right. You know, at the beginning, it, it, honestly, it didn't even occur to me. I, I really didn't even think that that was a possibility. And I think, and this actually we see a lot in out of body experiences, that we are conditioned by the physical world, by how we how we're used to, you know, interacting with the physical world. So in my mind, I guess I was a teenager. I was supposed to stay indoors in my house, especially in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. So then I would just stay there. Uh, and I would just simply be doing this, like playing around or flying. Very similar to how probably everybody, when they are teenagers, they have these flying dreams and they're just simply flying, you know, or they're just simply there in the moment and not being able to see the, how could I get, say, the consequences or how far this can take you. So yeah. at the beginning, I, I, I didn't even exercise any control. I guess I wasn't even aware that I could control them. But obviously, after I started reading books and started reading, you know, more about techniques and everything, I started trying to induce it. And then I realized that, yes, you, you can induce it. But at the beginning, I didn't, I didn't know how. I, I remember even going to bed frustrated a few times because I wanted to have that type of, like, cool dream, you know, when I was, like, 16 or so. But I didn't know how to. So I didn't know if I had to, you know, just focus on it. I remember at that time I would try to like just basically will it like, uh, let me go out, let me go out, you know, and mm -hmm. it just uh, it just wouldn't work. Uh, so it was later on until I started having a little bit more control with techniques, with the works on the on the energy system that, you know, now now and now, obviously, yes, I have a little more control and it. It, it's easier. You understand why it happens and what uh, mm. what promotes it. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's <laughs> super interesting to me. I've got um, my own little experiences, which, yeah, it's, it's something which has been on my mind for quite a lot. I do want to tap into more of the conversation around the near-death experiences. But before we do that, yeah. you, you mentioned the health benefits. And this has really stuck with me. I, I can't move on till we talk about that. <laughs> Tell us about this. Is there... Is there pro for, have you noticed that if you have these out-of-body experiences, what happens to the body? What's going on physically when we're in, I guess, a spiritual place? Yes. You know, most of the health benefits really come from the fact that uh, when you have out-of-body experiences, or even in order to have out-of-body experiences, the, the energetic system or the energetic body which is, uh, to give a quick reference, I guess it's the basis of acupuncture, you know, that the normal Western doctor works a little bit more on the physical, you know, body and the more oriental doctor, right? They work a little bit more on the energetic system and the energetic body. So in order to disconnect easier outside the body, you need to keep your energies or bring your energies and your energetic system in, into a condition of a good health, good condition. So there are energetic exercises that you can practice that we can certainly talk about them. And then that makes you healthier. That makes you not just your body, physical body is a little bit more resilient, you know, to, to little colds and really actually little and big things. But uh, uh, at the same time, if from an emotional standpoint, you are just simply more, more open, more confident. Your, your energies, your manifestation just uh, 
you know, flows with much less uh, obstacles, so to speak. So, um, so all of that, you know, ends up obviously producing a, a personality that is healthier. And the other thing also is, of course, the very, very important, you know, uh, psychological benefits. Because the moment that you have out-of-body experiences, and the same thing happens with the near-death experiences, maybe here we can go into that a little bit, you know, is that you realize a little bit better how certain things work. Like, for example, we don't die with a physical death. And I realize it because I am already there existing and interacting and with all my memories and independent of my physical body. And you can meet relatives of yours that have already passed away. And then the effect of that, obviously, is that here in the physical reality, you just simply, first of all, you don't worry about that as much, which is already a big thing. I know I'm here just saying it in a few words, but that's already a big mm -hmm. thing. And uh, the other thing also is that you don't spend so much mental time also trying to figure out or trying to make sense of where I'm going to go or of this big unknown that uh, for most people, right? Mm. Because now you know, okay, when I, when I pass away, first of all, the, the feelings that people describe when they pass away are very similar to the feelings of leaving the body starting to feel a little colder, starting to feel vibration, starting to feel buzzing, you disconnect a little bit, you come back. So I know these are not the normal feelings of the everyday life, <laughs> but uh, if you have already had a few out-of-body experiences, you realize, okay, these are the feelings of transition, of disconnecting from the body. And then, you know, you come back and you get used to them, you know, after, I don't know, three, five, they become all news and, you know, you're just like, more into where am I going than really what I felt, you know, as I was uh, as I was leaving the house. It becomes a little bit, you know, when it's a very hot day and you walk into a shop or in, or into you know into a store or something, and they have the air conditioning very cold. Mm. So if you're in a hurry to go buy, you know, a blouse, a pair of pants, some shoes, certainly you feel the change of temperature, but you know, but that it has become so such old news you have received that already so many times that you it doesn't even register you're really going to buy the pair of shoes and okay yeah it's colder here but you just simply keep on going you no longer pay attention to the sensation as much so to speak mm -hmm. because you have gotten used to it to a certain extent yeah wow that's that's awesome that's incredible so um let's let's start to chat a little bit more about the near-death experience side of things because i I know the majority of experiences have these out-of-body experiences as part of their near-death experience. What sort of research and what sort of things have you seen around near-death experiences? So there are there are several things. Obviously, there are several points of connection, including, um, and because what you're saying is, is, is correct, most of the near-death experiences experience an out-of-body experience, right? Uh, so much so that in the, the OBE, out-of-body experience in the OBE literature, the near-death experience sometimes is classified as a forced out-of-body experience. So that the person wasn't necessarily trying to have it, of course, but because of the, you know, the car accident, the in the middle of the surgery, whatever happened to be the, the case, you know, the person, uh, the physical body stops and this prompts the disconnection from the body. And... Um, and then, first of all, many of the things that are described in near-death experiences, and I, I have never had a near-death experience, by the way, but um, many of the elements that are described in the near-death experiences are things that we experience also in the out-of-body experiences. So, for example, the seeing of the light, the tunnel, these are very common sometimes when you're disconnecting, very commonly when you're going from you know, uh, the physical reality to another dimension or when you are outside the body going from one dimension to the other, you perceive it as a tunnel forming in front of you and you find yourself going through the tunnel and arriving at this other place, condition, dimension, reality, plane of existence. I always say that us humans are excellent at creating synonyms. <laughs> mm. It would be good if we, if we got together and we just agreed on one term, but you know, uh, I, I mentioned several of them because I know different people know them or have heard of them, you know, by different names. So um, so they arrive at this other place. Um, in many instances of the near-death experience, they see, you know, re relatives that have already passed away 
also they find this figure that is more described as more angelical or more developed or more evolved. And also here come up a plethora of names, right? So the being of light, the spirit guide, the angel, and we can we can go down the list. So uh, and all of these elements are things that you also see in the out of party experience. You don't see them in every out of party experience. Maybe even because the experience is, to a certain extent, I would say, less critical. Um, in some of them, you're just simply floating around the house because you are young, you know, you're not dying. This is not really mm -hmm. a, a, a life or death thing, but it's just simply an experience that you're having. But of course, as, as you start to understand this, and us adults, and probably many of your, of your listeners, of course, are interested in these topics, they certainly, when they leave the body, they can have a little more uh, control in the sense that by, by wanting to understand the things, you can go and experience some of these realities. Like, for example, I want to go and see, you know, this figure that is called of my spirit guide. Um, and I'm here just using the more generic term, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or I want to see, and, and actually it's a concern of many, many people, and it's also part of the fear of death, right? Uh, I want to go see this relative of mine that already passed away, whether it's the, you know, the grandfather or the cousin or the mm. uncle or, you know, whomever, or my, my very good friend, you know, that passed away recently or 50 years ago. Uh, so you can, you know, put a little more direction to your out-of-body experiences and then have those interactions and then afterwards have, the, have that knowledge and the consequence the consequences of that for for you right like um you know once you're here in the physical reality and you have had a few out of body experiences obviously you can you can imagine and you know uh probably people can imagine my perspective of passing away or of uh, spending some time without a body after this body passes away is just different than the regular the standard perspective when we only have uh, the physical reality as a reference, I guess, uh, which is also understandable. You know, if if many people just have the physical reality as a reference, of course, why, why wouldn't we, you know, um, be afraid of death or of that reference disappearing mm -hmm. naturally? Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. moment that you have had, yeah, the moment that you have had a few, a few others, or even sometimes one, you know, like in the case of the near-death experience, then already your perspective changes quite a bit so so yeah. that also promotes a lot of psychological health a lot of emotional health you're probably even less worried you know about making a mistake and being foolish because ah, you know <laughs> it's no problem we're all learning here and trying to do the best we can so no 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 big deal and you see this on people who have near-death experiences sometimes they become a lot more again a spontaneous and courageous sometimes too much and by this, I don't mean physically, but I mean sometimes they develop a certain level of moral courage of like, uh, you know, when we maybe there is a, a difficult advice that we could give to a friend of ours, but it's so we don't know where it's going to go. So then we decide, mm. look, let me keep it to myself. Mm. And sometimes it's part of the sort of like the inhibiting <laughs> situation of of life to a certain extent that we are sometimes thinking a little bit more about appearances and things but uh and, and rightly so rightly so there is a certainly a, a a degree of importance in in that but sometimes after uh after people experience a near-death experience or something they're much more open much more morally courageous you know uh, look, if my intention is here to try to help, even though this might be difficult, this is what I think. And hopefully, you know, it can be productive for you. And But if you don't talk to me for five years, and in five years you realize that my intention was good, okay, no problem. I, I have a longer perspective now in the sense that we don't, we'll, our interaction and us as, as, as souls won't uh, won't be restricted only to this physical life, but it will it will be you know much more uh, encompassing and much longer. So the objectives become much more long term than you know uh, relatively short term thinking only about this physical life. So that certainly makes people you know 
healthier as well. <laughs> mm, mm, exactly. Well, you've really got my mind going because I hadn't quite connected the dots with the outer body experiences where maybe you go down the tunnel, you see the light, you meet with relatives or people that have already passed over in a different time. What about things like life reviews? So we hear a lot in near-death experiences about life reviews where we go and we, you know, we have a, an overview of our life and we get to experience and feel the way that we've lived and all the interactions and the impact that our life has had with others. Does yes. that type of thing come up as well with out-of-body experiences? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And, and I would uh, certainly say that it, that it happens more in near-death experiences, much more in near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason seems to be, again, talking a little bit about the spirit guides, that the, you know, the, the spirit guides, they understand that the person is having a near-death experience. And it's sort of like they, they take the opportunity now that the person, you know, uh, is having that moment, you know, outside of their body to try to cram a lot of information in there, to try to give them as much information as they can in the short amount of time that they're going to have, you know, or, the, or in this one experience. So one of the things that they seem to, to be responsible for in terms of triggering is the life review, that they help them to, you know, trigger this memory so that they can review, you know, um, a very good portion of their life, sometimes their entire life. And normally this has a sort of like an existential purpose. Normally it's related a little bit more to this other idea that also we see with out of body experiences. That is the idea of the life purpose or the life task, you know, and that many of us, mm. I'm sure we ask ourselves, you know, since we are six, right? <laughs> Seven, since we start having a little bit of consciousness, what did mm. I come here to do? You know, uh, there, mm. and we feel sometimes, you know, there must be something that uh, that I should be doing or that I should try to accomplish. So many times, you know, in many instances, the spirit guides, they trigger this life review. So as for the person at this moment to sort of like, remember, I had, I had sort of like planned to go down this track and I am going in this other track. So now that I am aware of this, I can choose, you know, to to correct cor course a little bit or or sometimes not even to correct course. It helps to reaffirm the course that they're in. But it's very common, especially in the case of near-death experiences. And you probably know even much better than me, you know, of cases of people that, you know, they change their professions, they change cities, they change, mm. they change a lot of external things in by the way, there are many cases of people who don't change anything external, but internally their perspective just changes completely, their priorities, their values, even though they keep on working in the same thing, in the same field, same relationship, same city, but now they are just simply completely different people. And sometimes that is triggered by the life review. Now, in the out-of-party experience, you also have that, but you don't have it every out-of-party experience. Um, even, I would say, it, it's less rare. It, it's almost as if in the out-of-body experience, because you can have more, they allow you to digest things more at a, at a how can I say, at a slower pace, because you're going to have more time to, to get used to certain things. So, so usually they go a little bit more gradual. So I remember, uh, you know, the first out-of-body experiences after I started trying to, you know, produce them on my own. They were a little bit more about me going through walls and me flying a little bit and me having these experiences, which, by the way, many people think that they're dreams. But you know, when you have this dream, I'm going to call it dream right now, where you are, instead of fully flying, you are jumping like over two houses or over a hill or over, you know, two trees, but you, you don't quite pick up altitude, but you just simply keep on bouncing. Or you, you are trying to fly and you are like swimming, like close to the ground, you know, like struggling to advance. Mm. These ones are, I don't want to say for sure, but more often than not, 99% of the cases, they are out of body experiences. And what is happening in that out of body experience is that the person went out with more denser energies and then gravity is still making a little bit of an effect. And then you end up bouncing or struggling to advance. 
uh, and then you learn to control those that, that situation. You know, on some of the first OBEs, you know, you re- you start to realize, okay, this is what I should do. And once you you know release the ballast or release the, the load of energies, you become a wreck, lose it, and you realize this is not a dream at all. I am here, you know, in my in my place of work, in front of my house, etc. So it's almost as if with the out of body experiences, the development or the understanding goes a little bit more gradually, so to speak. But in the near death experiences, okay, he's outside his body by whichever reason. Let's take advantage to show him a lot of stuff <laughs> because we don't know if the person, you know, will be able to produce this, you know, 20 years down the road or, or never. So, uh, so then they go through many experiences, sometimes a little bit more in a shorter amount of time. And even because of that, they are more impactful. They are more, uh, for most people, they are more a definitive before and after in their life. Um, so that, uh, that as well happens in the out of body experiences, the development goes a little bit more gradual, so to speak. Hi, Kirsty here. I'm going to keep this as brief as I can, because if you're anything like me, you don't love interruptions or adverts in the middle of a podcast episode. However, I needed to be sure that you understood that there's so much more value and content available to you as a Let's Talk Near Death podcast listener. We have the Let's Talk Near Death online community over at www.letstalkneardeath.com where you can find extra information, grab behind the scenes content, links to research and articles, discussion and connect with other listeners around the world. My goal is to keep this podcast as ad-free as I can. However, in doing that, I'm going to need your support. The membership to the community is free, and you also have the option to upgrade to help support the community and keep the lights running. Don't forget to find out more. You can visit www.letstalkneardeath.com. But before then, let's get back to our episode. Hmm. And is it something where uh, the the thing that's jumped in my head is like a book where you'll read through a book and you put the bookmark in and then you come back and then you read a little bit more and you put the bookmark in and come back. Is that the same type of thing with an outer body experience? Is Can you go straight to where you left off and go a little bit deeper and then we come back into body then every time's a little bit deeper or does it not work like that? It, to, to a certain extent, it, it can work like that. And, and, um, and- and part of the reason is because he, he, how far you go outside the body or how deep the experience is to a certain extent depends on what is it that you're able to think or imagine or understand that is out there. And naturally speaking, at the beginning, we think we have an idea of how the spiritual, let me put my, my example, I don't want to put anybody else in this bag, but I think I have an idea of how the spiritual world works. And then it's all based on my conditioning, my knowledge, my life experiences, everything. And then I go out trying to experience things based on that reference and that frame of mind. After you have a level of experiences, you realize, oh, certain things are very different. And now you go out with another reference of mind and another perspective. And then after a few other experiences, you realize, some things are very different than ha- how I had assumed. So then you go with another one, and that's really what keeps you developing. But how far you go sometimes really depends on which level of reference or frame of mind you have and you have been able to attain. Uh, and, and that's related to the level of experience, level of spirituality, etc. That's why the out of body experiences and the near death experiences are so interesting, because when we leave the body, Normally, they challenge our, our reality so much. Certain things that we thought that they were mm. like this, we realize, mm. oh, it's, it's much, much bigger than I had anticipated and much more complex and much more interesting at the same mm. time. Mm. Uh, so th- I, I see that, uh, you know, with good eyes. I see that as positive, indeed. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences, the, I always get asked the question, why do some people have them and others don't? 
And I've looked into out-of-body experiences a little bit, nothing like you have. Um, I have some spontaneous things where I actually feel like I float out of my body, but I'm still connected to my body. It's a very unusual thing to describe, really. But yeah. as I've looked into the research, people are saying I'm trying to have out-of-body experiences and I can't. They've got the block somewhere it's not happening. They're trying to learn how to do this. Do you have any insight into why some people who are right on the brink of death would have a near-death experience while somebody else perhaps wouldn't? Or why somebody trying to learn how to have an out-of-body experience that might happen spontaneously like happened with you or other people really trying to learn how to do it are unable to get there? Are there certain things which make it more available? Like, are there things that we can do which makes it easier and more likely to happen? Or do we have yeah. blocks? Yes, no, a, a excellent question. Uh, and and, and in, in a very big, uh, you know, very big part of that has to do with, with energetic blocks, or, or I should say for many people, it might have to do with that. And by energetic block, I, I don't mean necessarily something negative, not, not necessarily, but sometimes it's just something that is, uh, it's, a, it's a very strong focus on something that doesn't, that is not necessarily compatible with having an out-of-body experience which might not necessarily be something negative. For example, sometimes we're in a period of our life in which we are very focused on a project at work that we like, that we are engaged in, that is positive. Maybe it's even very helpful, very existential. You know, I'm going to go, um, it's this volunteering work with this medical organization, and I'm very excited about that. And then the person is putting so much energy and so much of their focus into that that they are literally more connected. And then it becomes a little bit harder to disconnect because that is sort of like a little bit of an energetic anchor, so to speak. So in, in many instances are things like that. But going to your question first from, from the beginning, um, I guess, first of all, some people seem to have predispositions for different things when they are born, you know. So uh, probably most people remember when they were in school how some of their classmates, they, were, they already had a predisposition and a tendency and an aptitude towards music, but others had that towards sports and others had that towards science mm -hmm. and others towards literature. And we are just simply very different and we tend to have different aptitudes. So one of those also tends to be towards producing energetic or paranormal phenomena. And it, I know it's not the thing that sometimes is spoken about the most in society or valued the most in society, but some people already seem to have that predisposition, which probably comes from their past life's experiences, which is really where most of our predispositions mm -hmm. come, meaning the reason why this musician is so good right now is not, it, it didn't just come out of the blue. It's just because he probably spent many lives already involved in music and he developed that skill and now he has that predisposition. Mm -hmm. The reason why this why, yeah, the reason why this person is so good in in analytical thinking is such a good scientist is because probably he already developed that skill, you know, uh, for many lives. He practiced a lot. And the same thing happens with paranormal phenomena or you know, physical abilities, etc., like uh, sport, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so some people in, in, in this life, you know, when we're only looking at one chapter, right, it seems, wow, that person mm -hmm. has a, a gift from the gods. <laughs> but we, we just simply didn't see that the person already spent countless days, you know, honing their skill, you know, beforehand, of course. And this is something that is interesting about the near-death experiences and the out-of-body experiences, that it gives you this perspective that we are much more than just simply this life. And we all are. Yeah. Many people talk about mm. this. We are so much more than just simply, you know, Luis Minero, a, a man in this life, you know, so as if all of my lives I could only be a man and this is my only identity, right? So I'm, I, I, usually we stay very stuck to certain identities. So nationality, religion, culture, a Westerner, uh, you know, a Hispanic, because I, sometimes I joke, you know, that in 10 lives from now, I'm going to have a recollection of this life and I'm going to say, my God, did I look Hispanic? Just because, you know, these are my genes. And nothing wrong with that, of course. But, yeah. <laughs> but, so, but this is not 
a hundred percent of who we are. This is just a percentage and a small one at that of who we are. All of us, we are so much more, so much more. And it's interesting, this, this discovery. So that is, that is one thing, the predispositions. But in the practical uh, sense, day-to-day -day things, yes, there are energetic uh, exercises that we can learn to do to disconnect from things, to release, you know, from, um, uh, to release this energetic connection so that leaving the body will be easier and so that the energetic body will be a little bit looser. Um, maybe one of the better ones, I don't know if this might be the better moment to go into this, <laughs> is this exercise. Yeah, I, I don't know how many more questions yeah. there are going to be, but trying to help people even with the practical. Go ahead, go ahead. Chris. Yeah, let's do this. I feel like I could talk to you all day. I have so many questions. So you, okay. you just go ahead. If you feel like there's a practical element, let's do that because, okay. yeah, the questions will probably never stop. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. Uh, you know, one of the better exercises that I know and that many times it helps people at the beginning quite a bit is almost as if we were going to do a meditation, which, by the way, meditation can also already help. And this is part of the reason why it produces mm. benefits, because it disconnects us and it connects us with, with us, with more of our core, right? But almost as if we were going to do a meditation, this is slightly different, uh, a little bit more active. Than, than meditation, but we go into a room that we're going to be undisturbed. We're going to start thinking about ourselves and we're going to start to feel our, our vital energies, our chi, our prana, our you know, organ, animal magnetism here also come all the, all the synonyms that we have created for these you know, uh, vital energies. And then we're gonna try to move it inside of our body running the length of our body from the head to our feet and from the feet to our head and to our feet and to our head and to our feet and to our head, trying to be get a better handle over it, trying to increase it little by little, and especially trying to feel well the motion of the energies inside our body. So that yo-yo movement, that up and down movement of the energies, it's, it's almost like the equivalent of, of walking or running for the physical body that is going to put your, in this case, your energetic system in good shape. You know, it's going to make it stronger. It's going to make it more fit. This might be a better term. And, um, and also it's going to make it more flexible, more loose. And it also disconnects you energetically from a lot of the activities and concerns and many of them positive that we have during the day. And that also leaves you more loose and predisposes people towards leaving the body. So in the practice, you know, uh, doing that exercise, let's say 10 minutes a day uh, would make a, a ton of difference. Of course, a ton, a ton of difference. But like in like anything in life, really, the, the main key, the main key is not so much in the theory. It's not a complex formula or anything. But the main key is in the repetition. We are obviously going mm -hmm. to be better the fifth time that we're trying that than the first time. And obviously, the 100th time that we're trying that, we're going to be better than the fifth time. So mm. it's just, you know, becoming good at it. Like yoga. You know, when we do yoga, it's not that we do different poses every time. Sometimes we're doing the exact same routine, but we realize after two months, I am much better <laughs> than, you know, the first day that I was, you know, uh, falling down and losing my balance. Yep. So it's really, the key is really the repetition. I There isn't anything that, mysterious about it. Um, yeah. it, it so that that certainly will help with the predisposition of of leaving the body and then after that comes you know the the aspect of actually grabbing a technique for leaving the body and using the technique for trying to disconnect from the body now that your energies are looser there are hundreds of techniques in, in our classes we teach several of them but techniques that deal with you know, with breathing, with imagination, with concentration, with mantras, with, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's a matter of finding the one that works better for our, for our own type of personality. For some people, you know, imagination works great. For other people, the techniques of living the body through their dreams, you know, waking up in the middle of the dream to an out-of-body experience is, is the better technique, et cetera, et cetera. So, in a nutshell, <laughs> I know I'm leaving so many details that my, my, my colleagues, right. 
my colleagues would say, you know, you didn't tell them about this. And I, I know, I did. I'm, I'm summarizing it here, but you know, so that people have a general understanding of how you you, you go about it. <laughs> yeah, right. And is there any reason why somebody couldn't achieve the OBA? Um, no, not that I know of. No, no physical or energetic reason. May, maybe, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say that. You know, uh, maybe there might be certain special cases of people that have some type of energetic or physical problem. But I'm trying. What, what I'm trying to point out here is almost like saying, you know, there are some people who are already in a wheelchair, and then asking them to run a marathon just just won't work. But mm. um, but for normal people, for you know, 99.9% of the population, there really isn't any reason why why they shouldn't. It's, it's just more a matter of, again, the like going to the gym of the repetition. You know, we, mm-hmm. we don't develop a, a six pack, you know, with just signing, you know, or just uh, yeah, signing to go to the gym. We actually have to mm-hmm. go a, f- a few times, you know, and, and not that getting the six pack is the objective, but y- you know what I mean. Yeah, no, I get what <laughs> you mean. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. The question I want to ask you, and I'm not quite sure how to word this really well, but I know that there can be quite a lot of fear around these yeah. types of experiences. We've heard things about the cord connecting us, about people getting lost out there, different things like that. Can you just clarify uh, what is your knowledge on this? How safe are these experiences? And at what point should somebody not try to have one of these experiences? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, good, good question. Good question. You know, even in, in, in my book, I think, uh, I don't remember if chapter one or chapter two, but in one of the beginning chapters, I, I spend a good amount of time, you know, going through each one of those and sort of like trying to explain why they don't make sense to a certain extent or where do they come from? Because you hear a lot about this, exactly what, what you're asking, you know, and I see it quite a bit, you know, with students who you know, these are some of their first questions, you know, what if I get lost? What if somebody cuts the cord or, mm. you know, what if I'm not able to come back? Right. Um, yeah. What I can tell you, first of all, generally speaking, is these things don't happen. Certainly don't happen. Uh, we don't get lost. Nobody can cut the cord. Um, we will come back. It's Sometimes when we come back, the return to the body and the feelings of returning to the body can be can be a landing that is a little more rough uh, and, and that sometimes surprises and scares people. And rightly so. I certainly understand why that would, would uh, scare them. Even the process of leaving sometimes is so different that it can be scary. Like in the case of the um, uh, sleep paralysis that many mm-hmm. people feel, you know, in the middle of the night, you all of a sudden cannot move your physical body and your first reaction is, what is this and panic and some people really develop um you know an issue a trauma from that Mm. you know and and i see sometimes in certain students you know that they're asking me that question of something that happened to them when they were maybe also 10 or so and now this is a 40 year old man or you know a 60 year old woman in all of those decades the person has had that in the back of their mind, sort of like that fear that what if that happens again? What am I going to do? And then it has really crystallized, you know, in their mind. And rightly so. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to diminish that because that happens inside of our mind. And in part because nobody explains it to us. Sometimes we also don't say it to anybody because it's something so off topic, you know, that you don't mm. bring bring up, you know, during... I don't know, during Christmas dinner, right? Look, yesterday I couldn't <laughs> move my body. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but, but these things, uh, so first of all, most of those things don't happen. For sure, they don't happen. Many of those things, especially related to cutting the cord and not being able to come back and getting lost, seem to have, um, you know, appeared around the 1700s, 1600s, 1500s, and, and even a little bit before. And it was a, a way in many of these uh, mystical and metaphysical circles of, of that age of like controlling um, or yeah, controlling through fear to a certain extent. Sometimes there was the leader of the, of the group and there was a young person there or regardless of their age was very good. And, you know, the person realized that he was going to overtake them in power in the group. And then they would start like, look, don't go too fast. You cannot 
keep on going until I tell you you're ready because you you can get hurt. So some of the things really started like this. Our silver cord doesn't break. You can actually, I don't know if I might be corrupting everybody already here from the first interview, but <laughs> outside the body, you know, you can go through anything that is physical, but you don't go across yourself. So you can, with one hand of your astral body, grab your other hand and you can inspect yourself and realize that you're complete and you realize that you are you. You can you can grab yourself. So an experience that is a little different, there's nothing wrong with it, but let me qualify it as different. And different for us that are in the physical reality is to reach back with one hand of your astral body and grab your silver cord just to feel it, just to touch it, just to realize that it's there. And I know, that, you know, many people at this moment must be turning off the camera. No, no, this but, this is blowing my mind. So you can physically yes. feel it's it, what yes. it's like a cord, like just something coming out your back. It, exactly, and look, it has the thickness. Let me give you a few more details. It has the thickness, maybe of like three of your fingers, to try to give you an idea of the thickness. Wow. And also it's quite the thick. thing that, yeah, and also the thing that usually surprises us a little bit more is that it's not static. It's not like grabbing the hose of the, you know, on your garden, but it's more like when you're taking your pulse, that you feel the pulsation of the blood on your veins. So the same thing when you grab this here, you realize that there is energy going back between the physical body and your astral body. And this surprises you the first time, obviously. I had already read about this the first time that I did it. And it yeah. still surprised me just because it was different. But there is nothing wrong, you know, there isn't any uh, horror, Hollywood horror type movie thing waiting in the shadows necessarily there. No, this is actually very mundane. You know, anybody could do it tonight, really. It's just very different. Mm. <laughs> it's just very uh, off the wall. Of course, this is also, by the way, not the type of thing that I tell my relatives during Thanksgiving yeah. dinner or, you know, Boxing Day. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> just because I know that the listeners and you are more interested in this topic. But but this is really a, a fairly common experience. It's just very different. And you realize, okay, am I the one that doesn't have anything here on the back or am I the one that actually has an attachment? Which one is the more true me? <laughs> yeah, okay. And can this cord get damaged? Can it... it you know, for, for everything that we know, it doesn't get damaged in the, like in the physical sense. You cannot go with some non-physical scissors and, you know, split it. I, I have even grabbed some cords of friends of mine and, you know, you, you, you cannot really do anything. And it's also not like a hose in the sense that, you know, uh, the hoses when you go around, you know, I don't know, a pot there and then now it gets stuck and you're trying to pull it and now you cannot go further. It's not like that. It's even because it's not like a physical element, but it's almost like an electrical magnetic element. And it's not based on electricity or on magnetism, but I'm, I'm using these words just to try to give an idea of how it behaves. That, you know, it also goes through things and it reforms the moment that you're closer to the body and it extends. And it's a connection that... Uh, if somebody's a little bit lighter than you, they will go through the cord and they won't be able to, to touch it. But if somebody's exactly at the same level of density as you, they can grab yours. But they cannot pull you, so to speak, you know, the way you would pull a, a because it's almost like a magnetic connection, like a, like the remote control, for example. You cannot grab the connection of the remote control to the TV mm -hmm. and pull the connection to pull the TV closer or pull the remote control so that it slips out of the hand of the person who's holding it. So it's like a, a magnetic, electrical uh, uh, type of behavior. But it's not based on magnetism. It's not based on electricity. These are just words for me to try to explain how it is much more subtle yeah, than, yeah. than a physical host. Yeah? And it's a very stable connection, extremely stable connection, so much so, uh, making a segue here with regards to near-death experiences, that it doesn't even cut when we physically die. This is uh, the reason that was my question. People, yeah, this is the reason why people have near-death experiences because when we physically die, you know, the, the body already, you know, flatline, it's it's dead, but the silver cord is still there and it'll it'll stay there in some cases for 
half an hour, you know, an hour. So if during that time, the medicine, physical medicine is able to put the machine back to work, you know, with enough voltage, I guess, the person returns and had a near a, a near death experience or a forced out of body experience. Obviously, if the doctors arrive three days later to try to revive the machine, they know that the cord really already, you know, dissolved after some time. And now there is no amount of voltage <laughs> that is going to bring the person back. Yeah, wow. So, so interesting. Because I've heard all sorts of explanations around near-death experiences where perhaps that's where the cord has been damaged or, yeah, so, you know, that was my question around can the cord be cut? Because for me, that, that signifies the end, that there's no connection now. But yeah. you're saying that's how the near-death experience happens is if that cord is still in place for up exactly. to half an hour. We hear some stories of people have very long near-death experiences. Exactly. Yeah. And it varies, it varies from person to person. Uh, it varies from case to case. And it, it, it's related to how there is variety, for example, in humans in terms of height. You know, some people are... Uh, two meters tall. Some people are 180, some people are 150. And it's not that th there's anything that's better about it necessarily, but, you know, there's a variety. And the same thing with regards to the silver cord and how, how, how much time it'll give them. Now, the things that can affect the silver cord and the energetic system are not really physical things uh, or, you know, going outside the body and tripping on something or finding somebody mm -hmm. with a, I don't know, a big bat that is going to hit us. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, this, I, I also make fun of this and laugh because me being here in Los Angeles, sometimes I have some of these friends who are producers and writers and I'm like, guys, this is science fiction. And if you want to portray like that, go for it. But this is not how things work at all. And Sometimes they do, and that's why we end up with a lot of horror movies around these topics that are, are really yeah. not that real. Now, uh, but the, the the things that can damage the silver cord and the energetic system are more the internal emotional things. These are the things that damage our energetic uh, or that, that put us in bad shape. So a trauma, um, you know, an abuse as a child, uh, trauma from a past life. These are the things that damage the, the energetic body. And, and then, yes, they make us less uh, effective. It, it would be the equivalent of, you know, uh, having a problem in a leg and now we go on limping the rest of our life. So something like that. Mm -hmm. but the, and these are more serious problems. Some of them spans across lives, uh, honestly. The, the, these are the problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Wow, Lewis, thank you so much. I've got a million questions, so we may have to look at getting you back in. I know there's even topics which we haven't touched on, but sure. I've so enjoyed hearing the parallels between the near-death experience, the outer body experience, and even how you talk, You touched on past lives, you talked on the predisposition for having these experiences. I know that you teach this, um, this process of having an outer body experience, is that something where people can come along and they can just join in? Are they? How do you do them? Are they online? Are they in person? How does this work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and let me just say this, just to conclude the last uh, topic. Absolutely. So Sorry. Little, no, 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 it's quite all right. It just, it just came to my mind just to, uh, I guess, conclude with something very specific, which is the out-of-body experiences are very safe. They are safer than the physical life. Here, right. I am more afraid than outside the body. <laughs> Here is where things can damage you and hurt you and you can trip or, you know, somebody can break in, you know, not that it has happened to me, but, you know, here is where, where we have a few more friction and problems and things. Outside the body, it's much, much easier. Uh, but this is the place to learn. So this is why we're here and we try to make the best of it. So just to conclude that last topic, the out-of-body experiences are very safe, very, very safe. And we can talk more about it, you know, in another opportunity. Now, um, yes, with regards to classes, we give, we give all of those types of classes. We give them online, especially nowadays, you know, that people have gotten so used to Zoom. <laughs> so we give, Exactly. We, yeah, we give them online. We certainly give them in person. These ones are a little more rare because we have to 
go, you know, to, to the city and we have to somehow organize this. Uh, but I wouldn't mind coming to New Zealand. <laughs> well, but, if you can get in, the doors open. It's just the borders are a bit bit tight I right know. now. Especially for me. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. Uh, but, and we also, you know, if I, if I remember correctly, I think that they were telling me about this uh, just recently. We're also going to start having them uh, recorded on demand. And I think that, I don't remember if next month or something like that, uh, they're going to be on demand and people can just log in and hear them whenever they want to. And then there is a time, a month, I think it's the first Monday of the month, where people can just simply go and ask any questions to the instructors. Because it's not just me. I have several other colleagues that contributed with the writing of the book, review the book and everything contributed to their experiences. So usually one of us is there and then people can interact and ask questions. Actually, if I remember correctly, people can even interact and ask questions even if they haven't taken the classes. So people can go to mosaicwe.com. So mosaic, M-O-S as in Sam, A-I-C as in Charlie, and then we for wellness, W-E. Com. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. We will put that link into the show notes for this episode as well. Luis Monero, thank you so much. This has just been amazing. I love this topic and I know that there's been a lot of interest. I get a lot of questions around the topic of out-of-body experiences. Even the request for you to come onto the show has come through people being so interested in this topic. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for thank sharing... You the knowledge, it's taken you so many years to pull together all of this knowledge. And I know that there's many, many hours of practical application that goes alongside that research. So Lewis Monero, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty, and my pleasure. Thanks for joining me for another episode of the Let's Talk Near Death podcast. Don't forget you can join the free online community over at www.letstalkneardeath.com and I look forward to sharing another episode with you soon.